everybody, and welcome again to Revenue Insights. My name is Guy Rubin. I'm the CEO of Ebster and today's host. I'm delighted to be joined by Louis Cooley, who's dialing in today from San Diego, one of my favorite places in the world. So Louis, welcome to the show. Perhaps you could introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks so much, Guy. Good to be here. So I'm Louis Poulin. I'm Vice President of Revenue Operations at Builder Trend. I've been here for about a year and a half or so and looking forward to today's conversation. So thanks for having me. Fantastic. Well, look, really pleased that uh, you can uh, share your insights with our community today. Maybe you could talk us a little bit about the role that you're in at the moment and where the responsibilities lie and, and then perhaps a little bit of background as to how you got there. Sure, absolutely. The role that I'm in right now is VP of Revenue Operations for Build the Trend. And in that role, this is the first time that this role was introduced to the organization about a year and a half ago. And when I was brought in, I was brought in to purposely do what a lot of people in the revenue operations space has done. It's collapsing down the operations team, spanning marketing, sales, customer success, as well as our data team and our enterprise technology teams to have one comprehensive view of how we were looking at revenue and giving ourselves the collective ability to look at improving the efficiency of how we obtain revenue as an organization, rather than having four or five disparate teams taking individual approaches to solving issues that may or may not yield the result that needed to be yielded. So the last year and a half has really been about building that organization up, breaking down a lot of silos, breaking down a lot of legacy processes and tools and systems, looking for efficiency and consolidation opportunities to make the organization more effective. Well, that's fascinating. So in the past, marketing, sales, and success had their own individual operations resources, but they were all kind of slightly misaligned, I suppose, if everyone's focusing on their own goals. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, everyone has, every team has their own right flow goals and objectives that they're trying to target and they're not wrong. It's just when you're thinking about how that impacts revenue and revenue obtainment, that's where the challenges become. You have multiple agendas, you have different priorities, you have different leaders suggesting that different things should take precedence over other items. And so when you're trying to, you know, effectively be the plumber of that revenue pipeline, it's really tough when you have five or six or seven different teams trying to do their own little, their own take on how to solve some of those problems. So what we found, and uh, I've seen this in previous organizations as well, taking one unified approach and having singular leadership and ownership and a vision that makes sense to help to evolve the organization and what those revenue best practices should be and how they're implemented and how they're prioritized, all that's so critical to um, helping organizations evolve and ultimately driving improved revenue results as well. And just for the audience's benefit, roughly how many frontline sellers are you supporting across the organization? Our whole customer go to market team is around 200-ish people. So it's relatively small, but you know, medium size, I suppose. Very good. Very good. And did you get any pushback when you started bringing everything together or did everyone kind of buy into it? Yeah, it was a, it's a good question. I don't think we got pushback. It was kind of a, a show me type attitude. Hey, it's great. That the decision was already made before I was brought on board to do this consolidation. But then I think it was really us working internally to figure out what does it actually mean to us? So we're doing all these different things. Does that mean that I still need to be, or how should I be responsive to the, the unit that I used to support? And then how do I kind of pitch in and go all in on this revenue-based model and think differently around this from a revenue operations perspective, as opposed to a marketing ops, sales ops, CS ops, or a tooling or a data perspective. So we're excited for this. We don't know what this means. Show us how we're going to benefit from this and then let the results actually drive the how effective this, this is all taking place within the organization. Wow. Okay. And so, and how long did it take before you started having a positive impact? I can imagine there's quite a lot of gathering of information and understanding what the different variables are. So how long did it take before people on the ground started to see a positive influence on bringing this all together? Yeah, good question. I do think that probably in the first 90 days, I think there's some obvious things that I went after and tried to tackle immediately. Probably the most fundamental thing was just trying to align on what are the priorities? Like, what are we trying to accomplish strategically as an organization and getting alignment and agreement on that? and ensuring that same message was carried through not only in the business units that we're supporting, but across the operations teams that previously had their own perspective and their own take on what was most important to the organization. Then I think I also looked for some opportunities that I think are pretty typical that you see in the revenue operations space, which is we have tools that were acquired and implemented that were very specific to filling the needs of one particular organization, not necessarily the entire go-to-market team. We had disparate data sets that we needed to reconcile data sets that were put in place under really good intentions to serve one particular organization. But as you start to consolidate that, the discrepancies in that data start to show up. And then the challenges that come from trying to utilize that data as best as possible when it's not specific to one of those particular organizations. So that was definitely a challenge. 
we started to, and I started to drive, and I think results hopefully started to come within the first 90 days. But it was really just an opportunity just to get in there, really understand what the business is, where we are today, define the current state, and then try to figure out what can we be doing on a short-term basis with both my efforts and my team's efforts to help to drive some of the changes that were required to get us to really function as one solid end-to-end revenue engine. So if you were talking to somebody who's in a similar place to where you were kind of 18 months or so ago, and maybe they're a VP of revenue or CRO, and they're They've got all these silos. They've got about 200 people in their front office one way or the other. Are there any particular quick wins that kind of, in hindsight, that you picked up on that kind of got everyone on board quickly? Was there something that kind of hit hit home for everybody? Yeah, I think one of the first things that I, within the first 30 days of me being here was, actually, there's two things. One thing I'll talk about, which is kind of an obvious one. We had massive tool sprawl, which is I was alluding to when I was mentioning the, the situation when I first joined. So we had something around 130, 140 tools that were, some of them were being heavily utilized, others hardly utilized at all. Some tools, they were brought in years prior with other leaders who were very passionate about a particular tool and wanted to have that tool in place to be able to support their organization. One of the things that I immediately did was, because people can get quite passionate about individual tooling, is really trying to diffuse that conversation and driving that more to a business capabilities conversation what capabilities are we driving out of the tools that we've selected? What are we trying to accomplish? And do the tools that we have in place today within our ecosystem, do they make the best sense for the organization today? Even though they might have been the the right decision a year or two ago, given where we are today and where we want to go in the future, how do we consolidate around that? And how do we ultimately, the first goal that I went after is just, let's just save money. Like we have way too much sprawl, yet we have just as many productivity challenges, efficiency challenges that haven't been addressed yet. So how do we go about doing that, using cost as that driver? I'll be honest, it's still an evolving journey. It does take time to uh, to go after those and and to consolidate that tool base down. But I think we're heading in the right direction. The other benefit that comes out of that consolidation activity is your ability to better curate and manage your customer data in fewer sources and fewer platforms that give you the ability both to ensure that's the highest quality data that's available, but then also you're not getting disparate views of your customers and what opportunities exist there by leveraging multiple tools with slightly different sets of data that might be giving you different signals that may or may not be relevant to actually acquiring revenue. That was one aspect of um, what I focused on. The other aspect that I went after, which was a little bit of already a work in progress, was on the data side. Obviously, anything you need to do in terms of understanding customer intent, how you market to them, how you sell to them, how do you support them, all comes down to how good the quality of data is that you have on your customers and ultimately how much you understand your customers. So um, worked really intently with our data science, data engineering teams to ensure that the efforts that we had in place were yielding the best possible data that we could leverage as an organization to make the best calls and really try to understand our customers as best as possible. So those are the first two areas that I really focused on intently and started to see results as we did additional consolidation and as the quality of data improved and that the trustworthiness of that data improved internally as well. No, a fascinating thing. We have nearly 500 customers using EBSA across the, the world. And, and when we go into organizations, we find all the time that they've got these all of these point solutions. And you talk about 130 different systems. That's not unusual to see in some of these organizations. And still, with all of that money being spent on all of that technology, still four out of five reps are missing quota. So you've got to take these things away and focus, start with the fundamentals. You can't be data-driven without the data. And, and I think once you fix the data, you can convert that into insights. Now you're at the races and you can start to use those insights to drive process. Yep, 100% agree with that. And it is interesting, even as evolved as where we are and how much we think we understand our customers, we still have room to grow. Like every organization, there's no organization I've been a part of in my past that hasn't had exactly the same challenge to some degree, right? I did an exercise years ago where we sat down as an organization and based upon all the information that we knew about a particular customer, we looked at just the standard customer profile and all the different data points that we were collecting whether it was internally generated through activity and engaging back and forth with the customer, or these were third-party data points that we were purchasing from other organizations. And it was a really interesting hypothesis in that you don't need to have 100% of each of those data points identified and captured in order for you to market, sell, or support those customers. There are key pieces of information that are most critical, and we use this exercise as a means for us to prioritize, what do we actually want to go after? What do we want to pay for externally? What do we need to be sure that we're capturing internally as our go-to-market teams were engaging back and forth with our customers? Then ultimately, what were we doing with it? We don't want to be capturing data just for the sake of capturing data if it's internally generated. We certainly don't want to be paying for it if it's externally captured. 
if it's not actually contributing to a better understanding of the customer and ultimately a better experience for the customers as they engage back and forth with our business. So that's actually, I've taken that as a best practice. I'm actually applying it here to build a trend today because it worked really well to get our go-to-market teams thinking the same way around which data points were critical, where do we need to be focusing, how do we prioritize capturing the right information that would then contribute to success across the go-to-market space. That makes a lot of sense. So out of the 130 vendors, how, what are you down to now? Down to about 70-ish. I probably have a goal that I want to get down to maybe 40, but then also maintain a few core platforms, a core CRM platform, uh, core telephony background, uh, backbone for us to be able to effectively dial and reach our customers, and also a, a tool focused on our CS organization just to help them be more successful as we track customer sentiment, as we manage automated customer journeys, and then feeding the right content in to support that as well. So ideally 40 with probably about 10 being our core systems that we want to look after. And can you give us some visibility of kind of what that kind of architecture looks like? What's the system of record are you using Salesforce at the moment, for example? Yep, Salesforce is our main CRM. So we have those marketing cloud and sales cloud in place. We're evaluating service cloud to close the loop on that go-to-market journey. We use Gainsight from the CS perspective to allow us to track customer sentiment and to manage our customer journeys. And then we have CX1, which is our telephony backbone that also supports our support organization and allows us to manage the, our voice conversations out with our customers. Fascinating. And is there a, what are the specific North Star metrics that you're monitoring to see if the changes that you're making are having an impact? Yeah, so over the last year and a half, we've implemented Pipeline and Pipeline Health, which is a first step, of course, to doing more sophisticated forecasting. But as you know, and I'm sure as many of the viewers know as well, Pipeline is typically backward looking. We're trying to be predictive. It's not quite there. We're really evolving our efforts to be more prescriptive around forecasting and really trying to understand and document the cause and effect of as we take different tactics across marketing and sales and CS, how do those directly translate into pipeline growth, pipeline health, and then ultimately deal closure and higher revenue results. So it's a lot of what we're focusing on right now is just trying to get that defined. So revenue growth, obviously, and pipeline general health, stage progression, those are all key metrics for us. We're also looking after productivity gain. We're trying not to become an organization doubled in size, really trying to figure out how are we efficient with the tools that will remain after our efforts how do we ensure that we're not making it unreasonable for our internal teams to engage back and forth with our customers and ultimately safeguarding as best of a possible customer experience as possible as our customers work back and forth with us, whether those resources that they're working with are in marketing sales or in customer support. That makes a lot of sense. So we've obviously done quite a lot of analysis across lots of different businesses in and around the space. And some of the key data points we've seen that are really worth kind of monitoring and keeping really close to are things like the level of coverage individual reps need to hit quota. And sometimes you can see that those numbers be wildly different across the sales team. And actually, by understanding that, sometimes the top performers have got the least amount of opportunities in their pipeline because they're really diligent about closing deals off as lost at that kind of discovery stage. And sometimes we can beat them up a little bit about that when in fact they're hitting an exceeding quota while others that have got lots of pipeline, but perhaps it's not real, they haven't qualified it well enough, they've kept it in even though it's not necessarily in the sales process. Maybe they miss quotas. So I think monitoring things like coverage to quota is really interesting and looking at the, the part that looking at that trending over time can be really fascinating because you can start to see the influence that you're having as you're introducing these kind of more data-driven approaches. Time in stage, we seem to be a consistently a really interesting data point because understanding the average time in stage and the conversion rates, but also understanding the number of days in stage when we win. Sometimes those numbers can be very close, but a lot of the times, average time in stage and time when we win are very, very different numbers. And then suddenly, once you get past that kind of that golden number of days in stage, you can start questioning whether the deal is real because ultimately, if we're only ever going to win 20, 30, 40% of the opportunities we're working on, the quicker we can close deals off as lost, the faster we can get the team working on things that matter. Yep, 100% agree. We're in our early days of trying to define that more effectively than we have previously. I think that cause effect relationship between what we're actually doing and what results are being yielded, I think that's one dimension of it. But I think also what you're discussing as well is what are the patterns that we're seeing across standard customers who successfully close? And can we actually map that standard against the opportunities that are currently in pipeline? And then where do we predict the most likelihood for closure? I think we, have, we probably still at Build a Trend have a little bit of time to get to that point, but at least having our pipeline defined, opportunities defined by stage 
It's giving us early visibility into what that looks like. And I think if we go through the next iterations here over the next few months of how we get more predictive and how we actually look to more closely tie the organization's revenue goals to our efforts that are showing through the opportunities that are on pipeline, that's where we need to go next. I think that's what we're collectively focused on as we look to where we go from here with pipeline and pipeline health. One of the other things we find in B2B sales is that we know that in B2B sales, relationships drive revenue and really understanding who that buying committee is, is really important. And the top performers do it all the time. They really dig in and understand the entire buying committee. But the BNC players are very good at just engaging with a key champion, perhaps, but maybe not understanding the, all of the buying committee, in particular, people like the CFO, who can be quite scary to engage with. So really, if you're not engaged, if their sales team are not engaging with all the buying committee, then the chances are our competitors are. So what are you doing to kind of make sure that we understand which stakeholders we should be engaging with at every stage of the sales cycle? Yeah, that's a great point. I think in earlier versions of my career, I grew out of doing territory and geographic sales onto more strategic and enterprise type selling. But in the early days, it was, it was point to point. It'd be you and me guy on a phone trying to figure out, hey, is this the right fit for the organization? Great, let's move forward. Let's close this deal. As you get into the more strategic and the enterprise customers, it is complex. You are dealing with five to 10 folks potentially, and maybe a whole lot more depending on the size of the organization, the size of the deals, people that need to be involved in the decision process. So on our side, we effectively try to map our accounts and try to understand who are the real influencers here? Who do we need to be ensured that we remain in constant contact with as our main point of contact who are helping to drive the deal? And who are those other influencers that we need to be engaging with as well? And then ultimately gauging how supportive or not they are of moving forward with this purchase and then trying to determine what actions can we be taking internally to be able to move that in a more positive direction for us. So being really conscious of who those stakeholders are, who are ultimately going to decide on the adoption of this opportunity. And then ultimately, what can we be doing to potentially address any naysayers or any issues before it comes to the point of sale, where you just then get shut down and a deal ends for no reason other than the fact that, oh, I didn't realize that so-and-so actually had a voice here because we haven't actually talked to them at all during this entire process. So I think just being really conscious of what that is, mapping that out. And being really clear and realistic around where the customer is on that journey and where they are thinking collectively on potential adoption of your solution. Yeah, we've done a lot of analysis on how early you should be engaging with the economic buyers and the buying committee. And consistently, when we last year, we analyzed 4.2 million opportunities and we're looking at the whole buying committee and we score engagement so we can understand how much momentum has actually gone on with each of these stakeholders. And consistently, the earlier you get engagement with all of the economic buyers and the key stakeholders, uh, the more likely you are to win. And specifically, when you wait until you're presenting back the solution, if that's the first time you've engaged with them, the win rates are much, much lower, we found. So no, it's a really interesting point. I'm keen to dig into your past because you know, RevOps in itself is quite a new art or science, perhaps. And I think there's a lot of people that are thinking about stepping into that area of the business. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this area of RevOps. Yeah, sure. So for the last, I think the correct term is 20 plus years, we had a really good fortune to work for a lot of large IT companies that are kind of name brands. My career started off at Cisco. I was actually in a combination of both sales and IT. So I had an opportunity to do selling and kind of went back and forth between selling and IT for a number of years in previous organizations before joining Cisco. I think like a lot of people, especially sellers, I think I got to the point, whether it was justified or not, I just felt like I can solve problems that operations is trying to solve better than the people who were running operations at the time could uh, could solve problems. So I suppose that arrogance drove me into from sales and IT into sales operations. I would love to say that I had a perfectly mapped out career that I knew that, hey, if I go into sales operations, that's going to yield and result in, uh, in revenue operations. That's uh, so far from the truth. I spent uh, about 13 years at Cisco, mostly in sales operations, sales enablement, sales excellence. Had an opportunity to work both here in the United States and California for the first part of my career with Cisco, then had an opportunity to live in Australia for about the second seven years of my time with Cisco. I had an opportunity to go back and do channel-based selling in APAC and then move back into the sales operations space, supporting our vice president of sales in Asia Pacific. After that, I had an opportunity to move to uh, AWS back in 2014. This is at that crazy start of AWS's massive growth trajectory. I think when I joined, we were growing something like 70% year over year. I was hired in as the first director of worldwide sales operations and worked to better our sales practices, our tooling, our data to ensure that we were able to not stand in the way of that growth and ideally support the best that we could the, our internal sellers and in their activities. So I did that for about seven years or so, worked really closely in that with a Salesforce as a part of that, basically took an organization that was barely using Salesforce when I walked in the door 
We had, I think, 700 users, none of them happy with our CRM system or what it was offering. And then grew that into, by the time I left, a user base of about 35,000 people as the organization grew from about $4 billion to about $50 plus billion a year. I think AWS now has topped $100 billion. So I think, yeah, the foundations that we built were very much part of that growth. After that, I left, I went to Google. I worked on the Google Cloud team, leading the business process design for the lead opportunity space. So really working on the intersection between marketing and sales, lead management, opportunity management, demand and lead scoring and optimization to be able to help to fuel efficiencies across that space. And then just before I joined Build-A-Trend, I was at PayPal for about two years in their worldwide sales, worldwide revenue operations organization as a senior director, just really helping them again with the tooling, the data and the processes that help our drive our organization. So revenue operations is one of those things that I started off in sales operations and then sales operations, like a lot of other companies, and I think the industry generally, it expanded, right? You can't just solve the issues that are inherent in sales and, and what sales operations traditionally looked at. You really need to start thinking about the entire revenue engine, the entire revenue process flow. And I think revenue operations was a really good way to expand, to drive greater impact by looking at the entire go-to-market motion and the entire revenue engine, as opposed to just the, um, the sales um, silo. It's been a really interesting space. I had no idea that sales operations was going to result in revenue operations. I have no idea what the next iteration of this is going to be. So maybe five, 10 years from now, we'll, um, we'll be doing a conversation on how I went from revenue operations to whatever the newest practice is. But that's how I got involved in this, was really being really heads down on trying to solve sales problems, which then resulted in that expanding to revenue problems and revenue challenges and really trying to figure out how from an operations perspective, we can collectively address all those different challenges in a way that drove the most impact back to the organization. It's fascinating. And it sounds like the business you're in at the moment is actually one of the smallest you've worked in, looking back at some of those brands. So what an amazing journey you've been through. But, and what a learning curve as well. I think uh, they're obviously very lucky to have you helping them on that journey. That's great. Now, it's really an interesting space and an interesting uh, company with lots of growth potential as well. And so it's really good to be in an organization this size and really have the span of control and the ability to truly drive impact and really notice the changes that you personally are driving, which sometimes in bigger organizations, it's uh, more shared or less obvious where your contributions are, how they're actually directly resulting in bottom line improvement. So it's been a really, it's been a great experience. It continues to be a great experience. So my last question for you is one I'm asking a lot of people at the moment, which is really trying to get to an understanding of how you're looking at AI for the front office. So I obviously have my own opinions on these things, but tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the market and what tools the team are, are really leaning into and getting value from an AI perspective. Yeah, of course. It's impossible in 2024 to have a conversation around technology without talking about AI. So yeah, uh, we've we made it half an hour. That's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. No, I think from our perspective, I think we're taking a let's learn what's best for us approach and let's figure out what tooling we have and how we augment that. So we started some early efforts, which I know a lot of organizations have done as well. So I think the two biggest things that we're focusing on from an AI perspective is both AI proper. How do we get a better understanding of our customer data information that we already have? How do we better mine? How do we better identify opportunities that may not be obvious or may not be manually called out by our internal teams? and really thinking through how we can best position opportunities and identify new opportunities for us. Part of that is really thinking about how do we automate lead generation as new opportunities are identified? How does AI factor into that? How do we nurture leads as we look to marketing efforts and sales efforts around engaging back and forth with the customers? How can we take advantage of generative AI capabilities to deliver customized messages that are very specific to an individual customer rather than just the generic blasts that we're used to in the past? that typically yield no results. Something I think it's really interesting for us as well is really trying to get deeper into signal-based selling. And again, part of that is definitely AI-driven. I think I've been doing some variation of signal-based selling for maybe 10 plus years. My earlier efforts were like comically small compared to where we are today. But just the ability of AI to take advantage of identifying signals that even people who are closest to the account may not recognize, that's huge and that's transformational. So I wish I could say I have a perfect answer on how, you know, where I think we're going to be going next. But I think what I've seen from the work that's coming out of the AI efforts that we have underway right now, it's so positive. And I think the value in making it easier to truly focus time, energy, and effort on those accounts that make the most sense and will yield the best results for the organization, that's critical. And AI is definitely at the core of that. The other piece of this is really automation. How we think about automation and leveraging AI and AI-based solutions to drive automation. 
something that we've adopted, like a lot of organizations, is curating a, a knowledge base that we feed into chatbots to be able to do at least some level of support. What I'm very focused on right now is also trying to figure out how do we change that internally and how do we get internal chat, if you will, to allow us to do generative AI that would direct marketing sales and customer support reps to be able to better identify what's available and where the opportunities lie for them. So like automation of that is, it would be fantastic. And that's something I really want to try to figure out how we get to that in the future. And then also, I think, I think AI is also giving us the ability to go much faster than we have in the past with looking at real-time data. As we think about things like account-based marketing and intent-based cues that are coming through customers engaging unprompted on your website, um, downloading white papers, clicking into videos, requesting additional information, those real-time signals interpreted and translated into opportunities that immediately hit a seller's cue in near real-time, and that's transformational. That's one of the best opportunities that you have to sell to a customer, as we all know, is when they're deeply into it, they're, the wheels are turning, and there's a huge opportunity that may not exist if you delay that and call two or three days later or a week later. That's something I think is really exciting as we think about AI. And generative AI is fascinating. It's one of those things I remember, I'm old enough to remember when the internet was first deployed. It's kind of the same moments. Like, I'm sure everybody, when you first went on to chat GPT and entered your first search, what you saw come back was just amazing. And I know that we're only in the very, very early stages of what generative AI will be. It represents such a massive transformation for us. And I think the benefits that you'll see in the revenue operations space and our ability to drive revenue based upon AI and machine learning models is going to be massive as we look to the future. So lots of excitement and lots of opportunity that exists out there too. I completely agree. When we started on our journey, we started by using AI specifically to take away some of the admin burden from the reps. So salespeople are not very good at admin anyway, but they're really good at building relationships and running sales processes. So let them focus on that because AI is not very good at that and let the AI do this admin burden. And actually, the, what's really interesting is when the reps are taken away from doing this logging of their activity, creating contacts, keeping the legacy systems up to date, all of a sudden the AI takes over and it's 100% accurate because it's all done consistently in the right fashion. We haven't got to worry about humans and egos dealing with it. The journey we went on from there was looking at things like generative AI. And I'm a big fan of methodologies for qualification. And I don't know if you're using any at the moment, but we saw a massive adoption last year or a drive towards things like Medic and MedPick and Bant and Spice and all sorts. And actually for what it's worth from an analysis perspective, it didn't really matter which system the customer was using as long as they were using something. The problem was getting the reps to fill it out all out. But now all of our meetings are being recorded anyway. And so the AI is able to pre-populate the Medic capture for the reps and for the managers and show them kind of what objections are raised on the call or what piece of, of content is going to be most relevant for this customer because they raise these concerns or these questions or have this particular problem. So I think there's a long way for AI to go and I'm really excited to see where it leads us. Definitely. And I think Guy, you also asked the question, which tools are we exploring and what are supporting our AI experimentation? So right now we're primarily using AI capabilities that come embedded with some of those core platforms I mentioned earlier, Salesforce, Gainsight, CX1, we have some other, another chatbot that's being fueled through Intercom and their fin offering, which has been good. So we're still, I don't think we have a comprehensive strategy on what we're doing. We really are in the experimentation phase, but at least getting knowledgeable about it now as the AI space continues to evolve. And it seems like week over week, we're getting a new announcement of this feature and that feature and this functionality it can be very challenging trying to figure out where should we actually, which tools should we go after and which AI tools are going to yield the best results. I think in time, certainly it's going to shake out. But it's good at least that you have and that we have at least a perspective and we have started to experiment with what is going to make sense for us today. And hopefully that will yield to where we go in the future to think about a more fully baked and comprehensive AI and machine learning and automation strategy for to support revenue. Very good. Well, Louis, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I hope everyone else enjoyed it. If they want to get in touch with you, Louis, what's the quickest way or easiest way of doing that? Probably easiest ways on LinkedIn. I try to be as good as I can in terms of uh, getting back to messages, but feel free to reach out to me there. Thank you so much for your contribution to the community, Louis, and uh, look forward to paths crossing again soon. And uh, once again, thank you so much for the podcast. Thanks so much for the time today, Guy. I appreciate it.